included a big bulky graphics card supported by cardboard chocks within an anti-static bag. The bag is also held in place by an external cardboard brace as well. Popping the card out of the packaging, we saw no evidence of any kind of damage. A few fins were slightly unaligned, but nothing was squashed beyond repair. I have to admit at first I thought, wow, this is exactly the same graphics card in different packaging with a new logo. However, after a quick side-by-side -side comparison, it became clear that the updates went beyond that. The new fan shroud is even larger and now does a better job of protecting the fans. The LED strip lighting on top also looks much more impressive as well. Flipping the graphics card over, we find a very different design for this Aorus model. The full length backplate has been upgraded to feature a copper finned insert along with an LED backlit Aorus logo. Gigabyte claims that the advanced Aorus cooling backplate reduces the GPU load temperature by 3 degrees by removing built up heat on the backside of the PCB. The copper plate features a thick thermal pad on the underside which helps transfer heat away from the PCB. The plate then features small raised fins which help dissipate heat by maximizing the surface area. There are also a few thermal pads found on the backplate which remove built up heat from the VRMs. So this time around Gigabyte is really looking to maximize the cooling potential of this massive graphics card by covering every heat source in thermal pads. So then that covers all the new stuff. But for those that aren't familiar with the original model, here's a quick look at the rest of the features this card has to offer. Gigabyte's WinForce 3X cooling design is being used, and this employs three huge 100mm fans. Impressively though, this doesn't stretch the graphics card beyond 300mm, as you might expect three fans of this size to do. In fact, it's just 289mm long. Gigabyte has achieved this space-saving feat by overlapping the fans. Normally this would create a lot of turbulence, which could reduce cooling performance and more importantly generate quite a bit more noise. This has been circumvented though by using a counter-rotating centre fan. Gigabyte says this provides up to 10% more airflow than conventional triple fan coolers. The fans themselves feature double ball bearings to ensure the extreme edition goes the distance. The 3D active fan feature enables silent semi-passive fans, allowing gamers to enjoy gameplay in absolute silence when the system is under light load. An LED fan stop indicator provides a user-friendly instant display on the fan status. Adding a bit of bling to this cooler is of course RGB lighting. The LED powered X illuminates the centre of the fan shroud, while another LED powered Aorus logo and brand name can be found on the side, and this creates an awesome effect for those with case windows. As mentioned earlier, there is also a large LED logo on the back plate as well, so Gigabyte's RGB game is on point here. Removing the cooler reveals a massive copper base that covers not just the GPU, but also the GDDR5X memory chips. There's also six very long, six millimeter thick copper heat pipes snaking their way through two large arrays of aluminium fins. Now that we have access to the PCB, what we find here is a completely reworked masterpiece that measures 267mm long and 121mm tall. Gigabyte has employed a 12 plus 2 power phase design which when compared to the NVIDIA reference design should allow the Extreme Edition to work at much lower temperatures and provide more stable voltage output both of which should improve overclocking and extend the life of the card. Gigabyte also claims to be using Titan X grade chokes and capacitors for greater durability. Another cool feature is the aerospace grade PCB coating, which Gigabyte claims protects the graphics card and all of its vital components from dust, insects, drop screws, drill shavings and abrasion. Probably more useful though are the moisture resistant properties, which are designed to stop the card from short circuiting or failing if you happen to have a water leak and water happens to drip onto the back side of the card or the front side if it's in an inverted case. Anyway, the card is also backed by the Extreme Care 4 Year Warranty, although it's not entirely clear if the warranty covers water damage. Moving on, we find dual 8-pin PCI Express power connectors capable of feeding the graphics card up to 300 watts. That's twice the PCI power input of the Founders Edition card. Finally, at the end of the PCB, there are two internal HDMI connectors, which connect to the Extreme VR Link module. That said, unlike the Extreme Gaming model, the Extreme Edition doesn't appear to come in a premium pack, which also includes the VR Link module, so this would have to be purchased separately. Those of you wanting to overclock the GTX 1080 Extreme Edition can turn to the Aorus Engine software, which works very well. The software enables easy overclocking and allows the user to increase the thermal target as well as the power target. The user can monitor the GPU's vitals and easy overclocking modes exist, along with the more complex manual overclocking options. Voltage states can also be adjusted and custom fan curves can also be created. 
finally, the all-important RGB lighting can also be configured here, and there are a few more standard effects to play with. There is an OC mode which can be enabled the click of a button, and this boosts the base clock to 1784 MHz, resulting in a boost clock speed of at least 1936 MHz. I skipped that step though and went straight in for the kill with some custom overclocking. The core was able to accept the same 1839 MHz frequency that I managed with the Extreme Gaming version, and this should see the boost clock speed stay at or above 1978 MHz. The GDDR5X memory also hit a frequency of 1382 MHz for a transfer speed of 11,058 gigabits per second. Of course, due to the way NVIDIA's GPU Boost 3.0 works, we know that the card can run faster than the suggested boost clock if kept under the thermal and power targets. In the case of the Extreme Edition, this allowed the card to hold an operating frequency of 2.1 GHz after a 20 minute stress test, which was most impressive. Please note, I'm only testing the Extreme Edition with my custom overclock. Out of the box, it's identical to the Extreme Gaming in terms of frame rate performance. Even with the max overclock applied, it performs very much like the Extreme Gaming, gaining it just a single frame in our Far Cry Primal test. The Extreme Edition matches the Extreme Gaming in the Doom benchmark with 77 FPS on average, so not much else to say here really. Again we find the maximum overclock on the Extreme Edition matches what I was able to achieve with the Extreme Gaming, this time when testing Armor 3. Here we see that the Extreme Edition consumes roughly the same amount of power as the Extreme Gaming in its out of the box configuration, as well as overclocked. Finally I took a look at the operating temperatures and here I again found results that were much the same as the original Extreme Gaming model. Using the auto fan speed profile, the Extreme Edition reached 69 degrees under full low, which was actually a single degree higher than Extreme Gaming. That said, we are within the margin of error here. Without the overclock, the temps were much the same, the fans just weren't spinning as hard. That said, at no point were the fans on the Extreme Edition audible, even when overclocked to the max, it was virtually silent. Therefore, I decided to manually turn them up to 60%. At this setting, they were still very quiet, but I could now distinguish the graphics card from the case fans when sitting a few feet from the system. So while still very very quiet, load temps drop down to 63 degrees which is very impressive. Looking purely at the results there admittedly isn't that much to see. The Aorus GTX 1080 Extreme Edition looks to be the Extreme Gaming with a slightly different name. And well for the most part, that's kind of true. That said it really comes down to the fine details. What we're looking at here is a version 2.0 if you will, a more refined Extreme Gaming. Gigabyte has listened to consumers, identified the weaknesses of the original version and addressed them with this Aorus model. Given how much I liked the original model, I was always going to be a fan of this enhanced version, and well, I am. The new fan shroud protects the fans better and manages to look even tougher. The copper inset on the back also looks nice, as does the LED backlit logo. In fact, the LED lighting overall is much improved, but I really appreciate how Gigabyte hasn't just taken the opportunity to make their extreme version more flashy. All those extra thermal pads are very welcomed. The only issue left to address now is the price, and it's kind of a big one. Gigabyte are offering base model GTX 1080s using their Windforce coolers for just $580 US right now, while the extreme gaming models, that, such as this guy here, are $670 US, and that's a pretty huge price premium. Rumour has it that the extreme edition that I have right here will be $700 US. And while a very nice graphics card, that's a 20 something percent price premium. So it might be a bit hard for enthusiasts to swallow. That really is my only criticism of this new graphics card. Other than that, I love the Aorus GTX 1080 Extreme Edition, and I desperately want to see another one of these in my test system as an SLI action. I really don't think it gets much tougher than that. Anyway, let me know what you guys think about the new Aorus GTX 1080 Extreme Edition. Is it something you will consider for your next build? I'm your host Steve, and I hope to catch you on another video really soon. Many Magic the Gathering players asked the question... Dude, does purple tile look better? I think we should go with the purple look. I, I just don't think that the earth tones... Now everybody else in my family says we should stick with the earth tone when we recolor, but I just don't think that... I think purple's a better thing. But no, in all seriousness, many Magic the Gathering players want to know. Does Rudy actually play the damn game? Come on, can somebody explain to me? Does Rudy actually play the damn game? That's all we want to know. Does he? I don't think he actually plays. And he, that just irritates everybody because he doesn't actually play the game. That's all we want to talk about. Ooh, that's shaky. You guys weren't uh, drunk or messed up. You are now.
People want to know, does he actually play the game? So, that's what this video is. Let's get some legged. I decided to pull out one of my old decks. And people ask, Rudy, when's the last time you played? Rudy this, Rudy that. Well, in this video, I'm going to show you one of ten of my old decks that I used to play with. Now, before we go any further, the first thing I need to address, yes, when I actually play this deck, I leave them in card savers. Okay, I actually will play the deck in the card savers. Okay, I do not use sleeves, I do not use perfect fits, I do not use any of that stuff. So, before we even jump into it, that's the first thing. This is actually ready to be played. I think I removed a few of the cards in the past, because, quite frankly, um, you know, uh, I had them graded. This desk, this deck, this deck, this deck used to be mostly comprised of alpha cards. Most of those got graded. The only thing that you will see missing from this deck are all the basic lands, because I have them removed because I never played with any basic lands. All I did was used to, I just played with all dual lands, and unfortunately, you know, I had all the lands graded years ago because they were all still in, you know, that, I knew I could get the gem in 10. I guess, yeah, I'm sorry. So, unfortunately, all the lands, you know, everything was pulled out, everything was graded. So, as you can see, there's just not going to be any lands in the actual deck here. So, anyways. So, the deck has no, it, it's a, I think it was a 65 card deck. Um, I do have a sideboard, I'll go over. I just think it, I figured it's time for me to show one of my old decks, because there's just so many people just wondering, I wonder what Rudy's old decks look like. Does he still have them? You know, did he actually play? Does he even know how to play? So I want to give you something. Um, so the first thing, yes, like I said, I, this is how I would play my old cards because I don't want any damage because the cards themselves are literally pack fresh. These are there are no proxies. Um, when I used to play, we did not allow any proxies back in the day. So you know, that's the case of lot of scratches. So for example, these are pack fresh lotuses. Period. There is literally I. I think I could get some of these off the grade, you can either get a 9 or a 10, depending if I go BGS or PSO. You know, I'm not Sorry for the reflection, guys. I hope that comes out okay. Second thing I want to address before we go too far is the actual deck itself. No, this deck does not comply with any legal tournament sanctioned anything. Um, the restricted cards, like Moxes and Lotuses, there's more than one in the deck. Uh, like the workshops, you know, I run four workshops in this deck. You know, I run multiple lotuses, multiple boxes, all that kind of crap. So again, again, this is a deck that I built. Oh man, this is probably built. Honestly, um, I don't think I've messed with this deck in at least 10 years. So, I mean, first, I just I just want to show everybody what it is. You know, kind of what it's comprised of. And, uh, yeah, just kind of... As you can see, most of the power is white-bordered again. All the old alpha beta stuff is some of the grading. So, that's the power that's left in this deck. I used to have more in it, but again, everything's graded now. And I don't play! Um, again, like I told you guys before, the condition of these cards, the reason for it, I mean, the condition is gorgeous. These are pack fresh. Beautiful, not a single nick in them. Authentic P9. I mean, they're flipping beautiful. I'm sorry for the reflection, but I am not willing to take anything out of cases. So, first thing, that's how I would do it. So, I had I would run like five moxes in the decks. Usually, I think I used to run like ten. Um, I used to run four lotuses, as you've seen my other videos. The rest are graded now, so the deck isn't fully assembled like it used to be. Um, obviously, I would run the old library. you got to have a library. Um, the purpose of this deck mostly was one of my all-artifact decks. Um, I had a few... What I have a splash of white in this deck. Um, and as I show you all, you'll see why I have a splash of white in it. But the, the premise is pretty simple. It was a straight artifact, high mana, high draw deck. You want to maintain a lot of cards in your hand. You know, libraries, you want to maintain a seven card hand so you can pump out two draws. Howling Mines, so you can get a third draw. I wanted to pump and churn and burn the cards. So, that would be the first thing on here. So, moving forward a little more. Um, there's an Alpha Mox. This one is not rated because it's not really in gorgeous condition. It has some nicks on it. And most people are just like, who the hell cares? So, that would be that. Uh, next thing I would run, let me adjust a little bit. And I want everyone to judge me and tell me that the camera angle, or if you like me going over something different like this, you know, I don't do deck techs. I'm not into the new decks. And 
you know, the net decking and standard. And my, I, I don't really do a lot of that stuff. I have some modern decks that I played, you know, in 2009 range. I still haven't put together. And I decided, like, once a month, I think I'm going to throw one of these videos in. Um, next, we run the coffins. You got, I, I'm a big coffin fan. There should be four coffins mixed in this deck. Um, sorry, I don't know if you guys want to actually see what the card does. I would assume most people kind of know. So I would run four coffins. I'm trying to, sorry, I'm trying to get a good angle for this thing. So I would also run the coffins in the deck. Um, the purpose of this is if you, I am going against somebody who's running Colossus of Sardia or Leviathans or I guess nowadays Eldrazi or some big ass Emrakul. You know, honestly, I would slap them in coffins, that kind of crap, you know? If I couldn't remove it or if I killed it, it got shuffled back in the, the library or something from the graveyard. Well, go to sleep, big guy. And that's what I would do. Uh, again, you know, you guys know I love my Ivory Towers. So, you know, I would run Ivory Towers. I would run Ivory Towers mostly because, again, as you guys can see from the text, you gain life for every card in your hand that's over four. So, again, that goes back to me wanting to be a heavy draw deck with Holly Mines and Ivory Towers. Um, and again, I know the rules nowadays, every, you know, restricted one per mox, one Lotus per deck. I know there's a lot of restrictions in hand cards, but, you know, I just want you guys to appreciate the fun that this used to be. This is what I used to have, this was actually me having fun. Yeah, there was a time in, in life that I did that. Um, for those of y'all who are still here so far, keep in mind, I don't know what the value is of this deck today. I would guess this is probably a $30,000 magic deck, so I probably should have said that at the beginning. So, I would be getting life draw. Or, I'm sorry. Ugh. Let me go back to focusing. So, if I got, you know, my opponent was playing a creature heavy deck with big stuff, my objective was to uh, uh, silence the big creatures. Not remove them, not kill them, but silence them. You know, I would try to maintain a lot of cards in my hand. And again, this was, by the way, this deck was built pre Force of Will. So, there's no blue in this deck, there's no counter spells. It's probably a big weakness uh, compared to today's standards, I think. So, that is the next thing I want to bring out. So, I'd be having life draw from that. Uh, next, you're going to notice the old. Seems kind of bright to me, but maybe we maybe adjust that seem a little better to you guys. So I would have the old counter guys. And again, everything was colorless. So like six colorless to play this, you know, it comes into play, you get the one one plus the three one one counters, and you can move the counters around. So moving the counters around was a big deal. Of course we would also be throwing in the old I call them sushis, but you know sushis, whatever you want to call them. That was a big deal too, because again, four colorless, you know, a workshop on turn one with, you know, a soul ring in that